good morning to all and uh, today we will be going ahead with the instruction course on acute hydro acute corneal hydro drops and its various aspects our chief instructor uh, unfortunately has not been able to uh, make it right now because of a uh, uh, unscheduled another session last moment change she'll be shortly with us uh, dr sunita charasya meanwhile um, i shall be dealing with acute hydro drops the pathogenesis current understanding and diagnostic tools and following this dr prabhakar singh will be taking up non non surgical management as well as the resolution uh management after the resolution of hydro drops and that will be followed by the surgical techniques um to be dealt with by dr sunita charasya ma'am so right so starting with the pathogenesis current understanding and diagnostic tools and evaluation of acute hydro drops which had earlier been described in 1854 and was later described in 1906 and the actual term the uh, specific term acute corneal hydro drops came into being only in 1940 and since then our evolution or our understanding has been evolving continuously uh so until recently it had been defined as acute corneal hydrops was an uncommon complication of corneal ectatic disorders involving sudden onset corneal edema due to a rupture in the desmase membrane which caused impaired vision and eye pain so we'll come back to this definition in a bit and it was mainly seen in uh, the age group of 25 years more commonly in males and if the other eye had undergone acute hydrops the incidence of Uh, having it in the fellow keratoconic eye it was at a risk of 40% so it was seen that 3% of cases of keratoconus presented with acute hydro drops 6 to 11 of pellucid as well as 11% in keratoglobus the other cases in which hydro drops was also seen was post lasik ectasia trauma post rk patients those who have undergone keratoplasties either penetrating or lamellar for keratoconus as well as post cross linking corneas the top 5 risk factors were the concomitant presence of atopic disease eye rubbing younger age group presence of trisomy 21 history of contact lens use So when a patient presents it could be with a sudden onset marked diminution of vision with photosensitivity photophobia and pain and watering it may be spontaneous but may be precipitated by eye rubbing coughing sneezing nose blowing strenuous exercise or may they may not be any history which can point out to these kind of precipitating factors so uh, basically visual acuity is typically decreased and what you see is conjunctival hyperemia there will be marked stromal as well as epithelial microcystic edema along with intrastromal cysts or clefts so cornea edema might be so significant that it may even limit the view of the posterior cornea the anterior chamber as well as iris and lens so what becomes pertinent is to identify what is the degree and extent of edema as well as trying to understand where the tear of of the uh, hydro drops is and then if we po- even perform the seedles test it could um maybe sometimes show positive not because of a perforation but because of the transudation of fluid that is happening and if we see the iop it might be falsely low corneal edema can usually be graded according to the size it could be uh, within a 3 mm circle as grade 1 within 3 to 5 mm circle as grade 2 and more than 5 mm in diameter as grade 3 and of course the contralateral eye should always be examined for signs of ectasia and for also um uh, cases with concomitant vkc or atopic keratoconjunctivitis in most of the cases of acute corneal hydro drops they resolve spontaneously within 2 to 4 months however um as the adjacent uh, endothelial cells migrate they enlarge and migrate and cover the defect and the greater the area of involvement of hydro drops there will be a greater uh, duration of edema to resolve leaving maybe a visually significant scar and maybe possibility of neovascularization these could be the differential diagnoses so coming over to the etiopathogenesis um, as has been uh, previously described it was defined as just a rupture in the desmase membrane 
which caused this kind of uh, patho uh, pathology however re in recent times uh, dua et al have described that they, there is actually a split in the desmus membrane as well as the predesmatic membrane which results in the sudden aqueous ingress into the corneal stroma so uh, with the current understanding and uh, our uh, evolution of the disease that we have now understood um, let me just take you through the types of desmase detachments that are actually described here in the first picture on top we can see that there is a desmase detachment which is seen as a straight line almost like the chord of a circle and that is basically the type 1 detachment which basically rips apart the desmase as well as the predesmatic layer from the posterior stroma. In the second picture, there is an undulating membrane which, uh, which has a double contour and that is basically a type 2 detachment with just the desmus which has detached. And, and in the lower picture, there is the uh, undulating membrane in the periphery as well as a straight line which is seen and that is the mixed type of desmus detachment wherein both the layers have detached and they are separated from each other. So when we look at the case of hydrops, this is basically a type 1 detachment where both the desmase as well as the predesmatic layer have detached and this has been substantiated by the uh, histopathology sections uh, of the keratoconic corneas which had undergone hydrops and had undergone uh, keratoplasty, penetrating keratoplasty and the tissues were uh, subjected to histopathology. Here as we can see in the lower picture, there is the uh, rolled up margins of the uh, predesmatic layer and also the desmus uh, membrane is seen as the detached part and the endothelial layer has regrown over the defect. So if one does an OCT in any of these keratoconic or ectatic corneas who have undergone hydrops, we can see that there is a desmus detachment along with the predesmatic layer detachment. In the periphery there might be a type 1 tear that is seen, um, uh, the configuration. In the center, as we come towards the center, it might be a mixed type. However, as we reach towards the tear, there will always be two layers that, that have detached. They may be separated from each other or they may not be separated from each other, but they are usually there is involvement of both the layers, that is the desmase as well as the predesmatic layer. And of course, you will see the intrastromal clefts. In keratoconus, usually the, the tear is central or paracentral and it is usually radial, whereas in pellucid cases, it is peripheral and it is usually seen as a crescentic tear. So this is another uh, OCT picture showing the uh, rip in the pellucid cases. The posterior mem membrane break is most likely uh, seen there if you see there are two layers in the top picture there are two layers which have detached and that is visible and in the bottom picture on your right if you see there is a fibrous strand running from the posterior stroma to the uh, to the layer uh, uh, beneath it and that is very characteristic of the detachment in the predesmatic layer. So based on this, uh, Professor, this was also substantially demonstrated by Professor Murain from France, who tried to treat these corneas with the rib by actually um, bringing to work together the edges of the uh, torn uh, posterior stroma. He actually uh, put in intracameral air. He demarcated and marked the uh, edges of the tear, and then he placed mattress sutures and brought the two edges together and without uncurling the actual DM uh, membrane that was there. And this is the picture post-operatively. Within uh, the day one, there was 40% reduction in the corneal edema, which improved to 60% by the end of two weeks. So this substantiated that the apposition of the two layers could help. And in the series by um, Mellies et al, where they had cases with combined fuchs along with keratoconus, they were doing DMEC surgery and they uh, obviously uh, the uh, entire desmase membrane has to be removed and in 25% of their cases where they had done uh, DMEC in these cases there was seen uh, partial or total graft detachment however there was still no presence or occurrence of hydrops in such cases. In another series that they were doing they have performed Bowman's layer transplantation 
in cases of advanced keratoconus where manually uh, a pocket is being dissected and the bowman's layer was being placed inside however due to inadvertent perforation of the posterior stroma what they noticed was a classic hydrops developing in all the five cases that were being done so this was basically uh, proved on intraoperative oct also so what they uh, concluded was um, a total in keratoconus eyes even the complete removal of dm is not enough to produce a hydrops whereas a combined defect in the dm as well as the posterior posterior corneal stroma seems to be consistently producing a typical corneal hydrops this was furthered by uh, experiments from dua et al where a normal corneoscleral disc from uh, normal a normal eye bank rejected tissues uh, in that a 60 to 100 micron thick uh, deep rip was created splitting the dm the dua's layer as well as the a bit of posterior stroma this was mounted on the artificial anterior chamber and the intraocular pressure was pumped up to around 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury and they failed to produce any hydrops in this so what does this mean this means that acute hydrops results from a tear in the desmis as well as the duas layer or pre-desmetic layer only in the context of an abnormal or a aberrant, aberrant collagen and proteogracan matrix of keratoconic uh, cornea not in any cornea or a normal cornea but in the presence of abnormal collagen which is seen in keratoconus even up to the layer of Bowman's membrane and keratoconus being a complex multifactorial disease what about the role of eye rubbing so it's shown that elastin is again degraded in the pre-desmetic layer because of eye rubbing and this was uh, proven by these experiments by Kinoshita and Meek group which subjected normal corneas to transmission electron microscopy and if you see there is this last layer of keratocytes in pink and there is the um, bo uh, desmase membrane in blue and in between there are these yellow fibers which represent the uh, elastin fibers and which are the maximum seen in the pre-desmetic layer or this area at any given time in the entire cornea so this is basically absent when you uh, section a keratoconic uh, eye where you can see there's this absence of the yellow layer and this has been proven in elastin immunohistology studies also where in the healthy eyes elastin is present in that layer whereas in keratoconus eyes this is totally absent uh, corneal neovascularization was also found to be more in cases where there was a large intrastromal cleft formation or in peripheral corneas in near the limbus as well as cases where coexistent VKC or allergic eye disease was present. These were the few complications which have been described with hydrops. So what are the investigations that we plan out? Basically hydrops is a clinical uh, uh, diagnosis but we can uh, take help of various modalities available. If hydrops presents, presents without a history of ectasia then corneal tomography can be done of the other eye to know if it is uh, also having ectasia and to monitor that eye's progress too and newer technologies like OCT, UBM, IVCM have improved our ability to predict edema and to monitor the response to therapy. So coming to OCT, uh, it is very useful to uh, characterize the edema, to know the tear, how the site and the size, the configuration and to also monitor the clinical course. So based on this retrospective study of 191 eyes of keratoconus which were being followed on serial OCTs, what was demonstrated was uh, they measured the epithelial thickness, the stromal thickness, the epithelial to stromal thickness ratio, the hyperreflective anomalies over the Bowman's layer and presence of Vox drive. So the thinning, uh, what they noticed was, um, uh, whatever they noticed, they have basically given a classification of the OCT keratoconus classification based on these parameters. And there are stages in which they have classified these corneas. So if you look at the picture on the uh, left, the stage 3B, that means there is epithelial thinning, thickening, stromal thinning, and the presence of uh, hyperreflectivity over the Bowman's layer and in the stage 4 there is a panstromal scar which is seen so these were the cases that were also studied 
and out of the ni uh, 191 eyes 11 eyes underwent high drops so they had uh, an episode and uh, their OCTs were also studied and they were divided into the acute onset stage as well as the healing stages so uh, as you can see uh, most of the cases that uh, of the high drops that presented were in stage 3 and scarring seemed to have prevented high drops in the later stages so these are the uh, pictures of the typical high drops that have presented and in the case 2 on top uh, the top left picture the arrow also shows presence of walk stride those fine lines that are present so based on the study they uh, concluded that increased epithelial thickening with stromal thinning at the cone and the presence of anterior hyperreflectivity of the bowman layer is predictive of high drops in the future Another study by Basu et al. has shown there are three types of uh, configurations of the DM which were observed, um, one without, uh, one uh, with a break along with the curled margins of the DM, one with break with the flat ends and one with without any break seen. However, they also acknowledged that because uh, OCT scans were taken at 45 degree intervals, a small planar break could have been missed and uh, based in those cases where it is very difficult to uh, visualize the anterior segment uh, with OCT we can take the help of ultrasound biomicroscopy which will show the torn DM and the absence of the normal uh, continuous curvilinear hyper intense or hyper echoic DM spike that is seen and sometimes this will also be continuous or connected with the anterior chamber. Um, in vivo con confocal microscopy which evaluates tissue at the cellular level can also demonstrate changes and this is basically the epithelial as well as the stromal bullae or edema which is present in the first picture followed by the thickening and the hyperreflectivity of the cell borders of keratocytes in the anterior as well as the mid stroma in the second two pictures and in the uh, vertical row there may be presence of these hyperreflective round bodies or elongated or highly speckled bodies which basically uh, point towards inflammatory cells and these cases are more prone to develop corneal neovascularization. In a clinical setting usually uh, ultrasound biomicroscopy as well as IVCM um, take a lot of time and may require more technical skills and so ASOCT is a basic go-to tool to capture and assist in ascertaining what the patient is, uh, patient status is at the current moment as well as its progress and follow up. So with this I would like to uh, move ahead with the next segment and I invite Dr. Prabhakar Singh and welcome Dr. Sunita ma'am. Thank you. Sure ma'am please. Not all uh, high drops, I think. Um, you're talking about management. Patient pre patient cannot be cross linked, but I've got good patient with contact lenses. The only worry for me is high drops. Uh, maybe we can just take a history. If the other eye has also undergone high drops, then I think the better would be your surgical management. 
uh, because then the risks are more and if there is a concomitant disease like a vkc or uh, or an allergy or it's a case of downs or if there are certain other predisposing factors i think we can go ahead with a surgical management however uh, in other cases i think it's uh, by the time we are monitoring the case sometimes we get to know how uh, uh, rapid the progression is or how slow the progression is and based on that And it becomes even worse when it's a young patient and uh, uh, we have following that up and we have, we have to... So I think it goes case to case and in a very tailor-made approach. Thank you so much for your observations. To it, I think uh, a key point is also to look at the other factors. Like if it's a young patient with a very thin cornea, they anyway have great difficulty in using the pros lenses. So for them, I think it is better to just plan because uh, the condition, I mean, at that age has high risk characteristic of progression. So that those kind of situations, it is better to plan, uh, you know, dialogue at that stage where you even can, it's feasible, is, even though the vision may be improving with pros. One is the difficulty of well, and the second thing is the risk of having high drops, and then your only decision making would be probably a PK because if it happens in the center axis. But if it is little older age where uh, they are well maintained with pros lenses, because age has a sort of stabilizing effect, we know that. So those cases, maybe we can just, uh, you know, let them continue with the contact lenses alone. So that would so be also... Question, the, question, it's a very rational question. It's just yeah. an observation. There is yes. no science behind it. But I have, a, I am a big fan of pros. So I have a lot of patients who are on pros. And I do feel that earlier, they used to say that RTP contact lens stops the progression of ketoconus. We know that was a myth. So we know that ketoconus uh, progresses despite whatever. But then I do see with the advent of pros that patients on pros lenses somehow, even after the advanced stage, they don't develop high drops. So it's, making me think whether the pros or its wearing or the solution or the liquid layer have got some protective effect on the progression. Has anybody had yes. an experience like uh, this? Yes. There's also literature on that. Uh, on the, oh, no, I'm uh, not aware of that. There's a, a paper in AGO which talks about the pros lenses have a somewhat protective, protective. not the RGP, because RGP, RGP is causing a friction upon the... Only about yeah, the not the... Uh, yeah, so you're right, actually. It may be so, because there is some data on that from one group, I'm not remembering which place it has come from, but there's a recent, not too recent also, uh, way back there is a literature like pros and, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, certainly, it, I mean, intuitively probably yes, because one of the reasons why the condition progresses is because the regular, mic, you know, uh, mic, the trauma which happens, which micro trauma which is happening. Yeah. So, you know, with the pros, you're sort of having that kind of a protective but action, which possibly protects, protects the, uh, yes, and making the surface better, so taking care of the inflammation yeah, as well. So what I didn't realize yeah. So, uh, very good morning, and uh, I will be touching upon the non-surgical management of acute high drops and management options post-resolution of the high drops. So, uh, this is how I will go about. So, I will be talking first the medical management, then we'll talk about the, va the various visual rehabilitative procedures, which includes penetrating keratoplasty and deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, and subsequently we'll talk a little bit about the contact lenses. So basically, we need to understand first as to how big is the problem. So we know that corneal high drops, the, the, it's around two to almost close to 3% of patients of with keratoconus are likely to, to get uh, high drops with a mean age of around 25 years and uh, male preponderance. The risk factors, which Dr. Purvasha also talked about, so is like the earlier the diagnosis is made, the steeper the keratometry value poorer vision at the time of diagnosis and severe allergic eye disease with eye rubbing. So I will take you through two different clinical scenarios. The first clinical scenario of a 13 year old female who presented to us with sudden onset diminution of vision and this was the first time she presented to us with this clinical picture. So on examination we noted that there was a localized central corneal edema and uh, there were multiple cysts which we could uh, appreciate here. And on a slit lamp examination, we noted that there was uh, intrastromal fluid clefts and which was even seen in the anterior segment OCT imaging. So at this point in time, we started the patient on topical uh, lubricants. We started her on topical antibiotics to prevent secondary infection. 
we started her on cycloplegics to uh, relieve her of her pain because of cyclospasm hypertonic saline to help draw fluid out of the corneal stroma and we also started on anti glaucoma medication so that we can lessen the hydrodynamic force on the posterior surface of the cornea and of course to decrease the inflammation we also added topical steroids and but we suggested her for intracameral uh, gas injection and uh, compression sutures however the patient uh, parents were not ready for it and they lost to follow up and subsequently they were on these medication and finally she came back to us at the end of one month when we noticed that there was a very nicely scarred cornea the scar was off visual axis and on anterior segment oct imaging we saw that the cornea was very much compact and there were scars now taking you to the second clinical scenario again this is a 6 year old boy who had severe allergic eye disease and had again a history of sudden onset diminution of vision so we noted that on clinical examination that there was again localized corneal edema and we can again see that there are cystic areas on slight examination we noticed that there were intrastomal fluid clefts and we confirmed it even on anterior segment oct imaging but again we started the patient on same medical management and we we wanted to do again intracameral gas injections so these were the cases who defaulted actually i mean we advised something and but they did not follow that and finally he again came back to us by one one and a half months and when he presented to us he had a co- decent corneal scar which was again little off visual axis so in both the scenario what we noticed that despite just being on medical management and not being surgically treated the, both of them had a very nice uh, scar the only thing that we could uh, see not just these two cases there were few other cases also which i did not include here but we noticed that the only thing that we noticed was there was no vascularization at the end and secondly in the acute phase the 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 corneal edema was very much localized and not reaching the limbus these were the observations that we had and probably we will be talking little bit more about it in the last slide okay so now as we have talked about the acute phase that was that was managed uh, medically now we'll move on to the visual rehabilitative procedures which includes penetrating keratoplasty so definitely as if we talk about the role of penetrating keratoplasty in uh, keratoconus so definitely the australian gra- corneal graft registry says that the graft survival rate is pretty good and it's close to 90% by the end of 10 years and 20 and and, and 50% by the end of 20 years but the question here is is it so for the eyes which which are uh, heel hydrops cases is the graft survival rate same or different So there are studies which suggest that there is definite higher risk of endothelial rejection after doing penetrating keratoplasty eyes that had healed hydrops, and probably the reason that they explained was the longer duration of corneal hydrops, more than three months, and the ocular associated associated ocular allergy. So though I'm not talking going to the the different the stages of penetrating keratoplasty because there is no difference between the two and it would be the same. So let's just moving on to the second uh, visual rehabilitative procedure that is deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So basically, uh, the though the we know that uh, D- DALC is pretty challenging, and uh, the surgical procedure ca- has been modified by different surgeons that um, like uh, uh, use of big bubble. People have used hydro delamination. People have used injecting high molecular weight viscoelastic. to uh, facilitate deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty however all these procedures that i have discussed though makes your work easier but has a very high risk of developing macro perforation and could not be managed and we cannot just manage it uh, and we cannot go ahead with dalk in such procedures so these are contraindicated in this kind of surgery so now moving on to the different procedures that have been uh, performed on such eyes where there was heel hydrops there was one study by anwar et al where they noted that um, they did a predesmetic dissection and how did they go about it i will tell you in these pictures we can see in the first picture that the that the authors had d- done a trephination almost close to 80% of the depth and subsequently they started injecting air uh, the air injection was in the superficial stroma and they wanted to induce emphysematous changes in the corneal stroma and gradually they with the help of dissectors and uh, beaver blade they kept on dissecting it and every time the second picture we can see that though the dissection w- was not completed in the center that was the part of heel hydrops they left it like that and they first completed it all around and finally they went up went ahead and they dissected the 
the part where there was a high drops they kept on doing this layer by layer but after the section of the uh, say superficial keratectomy for the first time they again hydrated the surface they hydrated the stromal fibers uh, and subsequently again they induced uh, emphysematous changes into the corneal stroma and this is this procedure was kept on repeated every time and till they reached the predesmatic layer and once they had reached the predesmatic layer they uh, completed the entire thing all around and finally they uh, they uh, they uh, removed the superficial part which was there uh, exposing the predesmates over there and there was not and this is how the tissue looked like at the end that there, there was a very small stroma uh, i mean scar which was involving the deeper stroma the deepest stroma and the desmets membrane they did not reach up to the desmets membrane but they were li they limited themselves to the predesmatic layer and subsequently then they completed the dal procedure now coming to the second technique that was just which was recently published i mean was like they call it as peripheral pneumatic dissection and scar peeling to complete the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in eyes with heel high drops so again here the procedure is not very much different they again approached the deeper layers or the predesmatic layer by doing a layer by layer dissection in the first picture we can see that they did a, a controlled trephination of the cornea which was a partial thickness trephination it wasn't a full thickness trephination and then subsequently they injected air into the anterior chamber also and they had injected air into the superficial stroma again to to um, bring about the the emphysematous changes into the superficial corneal stroma and gradually they kept on dissecting again the central part the the part where there was a high drops was left behind like that to bunch up and finally they kept on removing different layers and once they reached the, to the predesmatic layer we can see in the extreme right we can see that what they did at the end they just caught hold the entire bunch and they just tried to peel it off from both the edges of the desmets membrane so and uh, this this was so meticulously done that once you are peeling off from one of the edges and then once that is done you just have to reverse the direction of your peeling so this will ensure that your micro perforation is not enlarging anyways we are opening up the desmets tear so we will have to fill the anterior chamber with air so that we can continue with the procedure but they made sure that the micro perforation is not enlarged to a macro perforation and again after injecting the air into the anterior chamber and subsequently using a dark tissue they they performed the dalg and they were about to and and they they were able to i mean do uh, cases now coming to the another uh, technique that they uh, that the authors have uh, discussed that is the wet peeling technique of deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty with hypotonic water and blunt dissection for healed high drops so again here what the author did they had um, first done the partial thickness trephination and subsequently with the blunt iris spatula they kept on dissecting in, uh, into into the anterior stroma and they kept on removing the superficial uh, stroma layer by layer and every time they used to remove that again they used to hydrate the the base of the stroma uh, with the hypotonic solution or hypotonic water and that resulted in swelling of the uh, the residual stromal bed and subsequently they performed it the same way till they reached the predesmatic layer and these are the, the the in the extreme right we can see the outcomes over two years where they had shown that the size of the scar had significantly reduced and the visual acuity were almost comparable to a penetrating keratoplasty yes it is said that when you are performing a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty where you should anticipate that okay the the surgical um, uh, i mean the, your surgery might require a conversion to a pk so you should bear that in mind whenever there is a very steep cornea you are operating on say more than 60 it's very likely that you might encounter such case so always keep a backup tissue when you are performing a dalg so there are different studies which says that how to go about when there is a case of heel high drops so basically to summarize if i say all of them have talked about the layer by layer dissection and all of them have said that it's uh, that performing a big bubble technique would be a challenging condition one uh, clinic one uh, study that was ramamurthy and ramesh in all of, in rest of the uh, i mean uh, studies they said that you can go about and and reach up to the predesmatic layer by layer by layer dissection and they had left behind the the residual scar over there however in a study by ramamurthy and ramesh what they did they went right up to the predesmatic layer and then they 
punched out the central desmets membrane and the scar area along with the residual stromal tissue and then finally they they placed the uh, direct tissue over that and then they sutured it now uh, coming to the third visual rehabilitative modality that is the use of contact lens so i won't be taking much time because uh, so uh, we know that as such the when the keratoconus is severe the corneal apex becomes very much steeper and it becomes very difficult to fit a contact lens and it's a, a cumbersome and challenging task however when there is a, a resolved high drops what exactly happens it to some extent makes the cornea much flatter and this is somewhat if if the scar is not in the visual axis can ha can have a good uh, fitting of the contact lens also so basically rgp contact lens is something which we should always try and preferably a tri curve or more peripheral curve if it's there that would be said to be better rose k contact lenses are the multi curve lenses which will have a smaller optical zone and we we usually see that in more than 90% of the cases we can fit up fit such patients who have, who have their who i mean in whom there was a heel high drops we can fit them with rose k contact lens and almost close to 90% of the patients provided again the scar is not involving the visual axis and rose k to excel semi scleral contact lens they are said to improve visual acuity as well as comfort because at times if the patient is not very much okay with the rose k contact lens so we can go for rose k uh, k2 excel semi scleral contact lenses yes now once uh, obviously there is always an issue of comfort so we can always try a piggy back lens in such patients where there is a corneal scar so there is a tendency so how do we do such kind of fitting so first we go for a say now the the corneal curve which is little much little bit flatter compared to what it was so we will first go ahead and try fitting a soft contact lens and once we are uh, we are sure as to the patient is, has a very nice fit with soft contact lens we can just go ahead and place a uh, uh, and accordingly we will do a topography now with soft contact lens uh, lenses in place now the topography that we will have and based on that we will decide the base curve of the the rgp lenses now we have an rgp lenses that we have already fitted over the soft contact lens we do over refraction over that and subsequently we add up uh, those part to the final uh, hard, uh, rgp lenses that we have so this is how your comfort uh, post high drops is increased in such patients as already discussed just now that like scleral contact lenses have other contact lenses which are now um, considered to be one of the best lenses because the visual acuity in such in, in patients can be improved to uh, uh, to near normal levels also and uh, pros is definitely because it gives you a very acceptable fit and adequate because there is an adequate clearance there is no touch with no air bubble in the fluid and there is no usually you should also check with while fitting such that there should not be any impingement of the vessels conjunctival vessels so i'm to summarize if there is a localized corneal high drops which is not reaching the limbus it's likely that it will heal without vascularization so even a medical management can work in such patients and dalk is dalk over pk is a viable option with benefits of being less immunogenic and and, and equal visual outcomes as compared to penetrating keratoplasty thank you very nice presentation from hakar hakar you one slide you mentioned about uh, there's a literature in it, like the the eyes which had a keratoplasty post high drops mm -hmm. they had a higher risk of rejection did yeah. i yeah so what was the reason cited for that so they said that if the the first thing was they they planned the surgery the high drops stayed there for a very long time say more than 3 months and this is in cases where there was a diffuse high drops not a localized one that was the first thing they said and the second thing that they mentioned was just yes that the associated ocular allergies so that was also a, a second factor which was responsible for a, a risk of rejection because obviously the inflammation will in cases which were managed after the high drops had resolved yes 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 on, right right but one of the reasons could have been the uh, the vascularization which can tend to occur when with the prolonged right. uh, edema okay. in the cornea yeah 
so any any time when there is um, the the coronal edema is staying there for more than 3 months it's inviting vessel salts also so and that is probably the reason inflammation is there so again the risk of rejection would be more any other questions for uh, prabhakar from anybody I now invite uh, Dr. Sunita Chaurasia for uh, ma'am for her talk on surgical management of acute high drops. She needs no introduction. She is the uh, master in the field of endothelial keratoplasty as well as lamellar keratoplasty, and she is um, a brilliant surgeon at the L V Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. Thanks, Purvasha, for the kind introduction, and thank you all for being in the session with us. So I'll be dwelling upon this topic of uh, surgical management of uh, high drops, uh, indication principles, techniques, and the outcomes with various management. So Purvasha and Prabhakar have nicely covered uh, the respective talks, and I'll be talking on the surgical management. We all know, and uh, Purvasha highlighted how the high drops occurs, and Basically, this is because of a sudden split in the Desmond's membrane at Dua's layer, leading to a stromal edema, and the extent of the edema depends upon the size of the defect. This complication can be seen in advanced keratoconus and other ectases, and as uh, 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 Madam pointed out, it can also occur in certain other uh, conditions which are involving thin cornea where there may be a collagen abnormality, not always seen in uh, you know, keratoconus and pellucid, but there are many other entities where we don't understand the pathogenesis, and it can also occur as a complication of a trauma in the eye in so-called normal subjects where we see high drops. Now, traditionally, we have uh, been managing these cases with a desmetopexy with tamponading gases, and these have been long-acting gases such as C3F8 and SF6. The this is based upon the principle to oppose the posterior membrane by pushing it to the anterior corneal layers. Technically, this would not be a very ideal procedure in biomechanically weak corneas because you're trying to oppose a weaker tissue and trying to push the posterior membrane against a weaker tissue. And this, apart from that, this also has several problems such as risk of cataracts, urizavella syndrome, pupillary block in young fakic eyes. And these would also be inadequate and inferior defects because obviously the, uh, when the patient is upright, it does not work that way. And this is just to show one uh, case where there was a pupillary block with C3F8. Now, why do we need to treat these cases simply because many of these uh, long-standing high drops can result in uh, neovascularization of the cornea, especially if they're large ones. So that is the whole reason why surgical intervention would be required. Another way of management of these cases is by applying full thickness sutures, compression sutures with tamponading gases. And this is based upon the principle of bringing the edges of the split desmus membrane together. So th this is, in this technique, in many of the techniques, it is to pass the sutures through and through the cornea so that you are able to oppose the Desmet's membrane. Some of the techniques also involve venting of the anterior surface so as to remove the fluid which is there in the stroma. So I'll be just presenting a few uh, conditions where we have done a little modified approach to the compression sutures and how this has uh, avoided the certain issues which used to happen with the earlier methods of management of high drops. And I'll be discussing in three situations, namely keratoconus, pellucid, and a case of trauma. Now, this is the first uh, representative case of a keratoconus. This was a patient who had non-resolving high drops of three weeks duration and was do also developing vessels in the temporal cornea. Though initially he was in medical management, it was not resolving and leading to complications such as vascularization. So the procedure just simply uh, involves making a side port to in inject air bubble. It is not tamponizing gases, it's just air bubble to delineate the level of the posterior membrane. This is important to understand uh, where is the posterior membrane so that the sutures where you're passing, you have an idea about it. And these sutures are partial thickness. They are not full thickness through and through. They are just partial thickness within the stroma to create a compression or an indentation effect on the surface. And the and air bubble provides a kind of guidance to what level we are. And once you do that, we can see that there's a significant amount of uh, edema resolution which happens while passing sutures itself because it, the, the sutures act as venting also of the fluid. And then when you compress, when you provide the compression sutures, uh, the edema in the periphery is seen to resolve first. So this is 
the post of day one picture. The patient had limited cooperation on day one, and then we got the pictures done on day three. We can see a remarkable improvement in the corneal edema. So a similar case of pellucid marginal corneal degeneration. So similar technique. Now in pellucid, the break happens to be crescentric to the limbus, and usually it is either inferior or superior. So here again, we make a side port, put a small little amount of air bubble, and uh, the sutures are taken radial to the crescentric breach, which is in this case at the inferior location. The small amount of air bubble is simply taken to just push the Desmond's membrane um, opposing to the anterior corneal layers. And uh, uh, this should not be occupying the anterior chamber uh, too much because there's a risk of pupillary block even with a small amount of air. So it should be less than 20 to 30% of the anterior chamber volume. So this is a post of say, uh, day, uh, day one of picture of the same patient. And this is the third patient I'll be discussing about a case of post-trauma. This was a very unique case where the child had a thin cornea in the opposite eye as well. It was not really ectasia, but then this patient had an overall thin cornea and he had an injury with a, with a ball. Not a very significant impact but as per the parents and the boys recall, but this is how the picture looked like. So if you can see the picture, it looks like complete edema in the cornea and the OCT is, is substantiated by the fact that there's a breach in the posterior membrane and the area of the translucency corresponds to the site of the breach. So there's a circumferential 360 degrees breach, which is leading to accumulation of fluid within the stroma. Now, how did we manage this? This patient, again, similar technique was done, side port with an air injection to delineate the level of the uh, breach, and partial thickness sutures have been taken in this case. In this case, we had to take circumferential sutures because the breach is all throughout in the mid-peripheral part of the cornea. And these sutures have to be a little tighter and they have to create a compression effect so that the posterior defect comes closer to one another. So it almost looks like near keratoplasty, but this is what was required simply because the breach was quite extensive. And this was followed by a BCL application. Now this is the day one picture of this patient. There was a dramatic resolution on the day one because we have addressed the cause. One is by the compression, we've removed the fluid in the stroma. And the second thing is bringing the edges of the tear closer with a little amount of air bubble, which was seen on the first day. And this is at one week where the patient, when the child's visual acuity was restored. So what are the advantages of the modified step? So one of the modification step is taking partial thickness sutures. Now this makes suturing of the grossly edematous hydrops cornea way easier. Unlike if you want to take the sutures through and through, it is very, very difficult to locate because of the significant edema there. But if you're partial thickness, your suturing is way, way easier. No special needle is required. The sutures serve the role of venting incision also by draining the fluid. And the resolution of the edema, as we saw in the first picture and uh, other video also, happens to be seen intraoperatively as well. Air bubble is used. Air bubble means 100% air is used, and there's no C3, F8, or SF6. And bubble is size should be less than 30% of the anterior chamber volume. So this eliminates the risk of pupillary block and SF6 and C3, F8 gas rate complication, which can occur in the long term, such as cataract, urizavella syndrome, and many others, which can occur because of air bubble in the anterior chamber. The technique is also not dependent upon the gas in the anterior chamber, so it is effective in inferior breaks as well, and can be applied to diverse indications, such as keratoconus, pellucid, and trauma-related high drops. Now, what are the suturing strategies and patterns? The guiding principle for the suturing should be perpendicular to the tear when you can identify the tear. In quite often, in many cases, many situations where the edema is profuse, we can't make out where the breach is. It's really hard to know where the tear is. So if we can locate it, the guiding principle should be, the cavit should be to have the sutures perpendicular to the tear, as is shown in the first picture. If we are not able to see it, in a case like keratoconus, because these tend to happen in the central part of the cornea, the suturing pattern could be arcuate. It could be circumferential from limbus, uh, starting from the periphery to the center. And in the center, because we want to avoid the sutures passing through the stroma, this could be infinity sutures, where the, the sutures in the center are more like overlay. They don't pass through the stroma. They are on the surface of the cornea. So it could be an infinity suture. And these are the various patterns which can be attempted in various types of hydrops, which you can see in uh, situations where there could be multiple loculi, or it could be uh, related to the uh, location. We can make use of these patterns to uh, provide the compression effect. In pellucid, because the tear of almost always is crescentric to the limbus, should be in the radial fashion as is shown in the figure six. 
One of the ways of identifying the posterior tear could be by using an endoilluminator or a light pipe. This also delineates in some cases the, uh, the breach and where it is located. Now, let's go into what is the mechanism of quick resolution. The resolution happens on a, uh, the way the, uh, the edema resolves is based upon the concept similar to a buccal surgery for retinal detachment, where when we provide external tamponade, there's an apposition effect. So similarly with the compression sutures, what we are creating, if you can see the cartoon, the effect of compression sutures is to bring the biomechanically weak cornea closer to the posterior defect and thereby facilitating the natural process of edema resolution, which happens um, as, a, as a natural mechanism. What is the post-op regimen? Post-op, the patient still has to be using hypotonic saline until the time the edema has substantially uh, disappeared. Antibiotic is required because we need a B-cell in place, we'll be putting sutures and sometimes when the cornea is very thin, we may not be able to bury the suture. So putting a B-cell helps in, in many ways, it makes the patient comfortable and if any point we've not been able to bury the sutures, it also gives a symptomatic relief to the patient. IOP lowering agents uh, can be used in very thin corneas. Steroids have to be given to suppress the inflammation because any fluid in the cornea is an immunogenic uh, cause. So steroids have to be given to improve the comfort and patients should be instructed to avoid uh, rubbing the eyes because certain times if they rub their eyes, the sutures can have a gaping with the thin cornea. So that instruction should be a part of management in high drops when you, when you are managing pediatric patients. Follow preview and suture management. Suture removal should be done when the suture loosening is noted and it should not be prematurely removed. The cornea, the posterior membrane should look sufficiently healed well. Because if we remove the sutures prematurely, again, the defect because of weakening, inherent weakening, you can again have a gaping and uh, edema can, subs can uh, kind of uh, reappear, so resurface. So it is important to remove the sutures only, only when we feel the healing has been sufficient. However, not to delay it uh, to, to very advanced stages also, otherwise you end up having scarring. So you have to ha just have a balance of uh, this uh, time point of removing the sutures based upon the healing of the posterior membrane. So this is the outcome of 25 cases which was managed with this modified technique. Most of these cases uh, were managed, were, were, which were managed were cases where the edema was grade 3, which, which means that it was larger than a, circum, a circle of 5 millimeters diameter. 14 cases were keratoconus, 5 were pellucid and 1 was a thin cornea as what was described in the third case. Recovery of the edema from pre-op to the day 1 was 90% on day 1, 95 to 99% by, by 1 week. Edema may resolve, but then uh, the healing is the point where we have to remove the sutures. The pachymetry from the initial baseline unrecordable came down to 714 microns on day one to 593 microns by one week. And the mean time interval complete removal of sutures was 50 days. This is taking into account pellucid also where we did not remove sutures in many of these patients because it was giving a kind of a, a improvement in the refractive stability also. 10 patients were managed with the glasses in the series. One patient required a peaky uh, keratoplasty, rest were managed with contact lenses, and in three, visual acuity could not be assessed because these were patients of Down syndrome and much uh, visual assessment and rehabilitation could not be really attempted in those patients. So mean follow-up has, has ranged from two months to 24 months in these patients with an average of 11 months. So do we need compression sutures in all cases? Do we need to manage all patients surgically? Uh, we don't have to, but uh, this is one algorithm which could be used for management of acute high drops depending upon the cause. So if we have care, we can determine what the cause of the high drops is. For pellucid, because the tear is in the periphery and cornea is relatively very weak, these patients should go for compression sutures radially. With keratoconus, one has to look at the size of the high drop. Size of the high drops, if it is like grade one to grade two, which means less than five millimeters, one can simply go for conservative management. These need not be managed with compression sutures. We need not do anything because resolution happens far quicker in, in smaller size high drops with a one to two weeks time. So these cases need not need intervention. However, there's a possibility that when they may begin with a smaller defect and the patient, when they rub their eyes, the edema can increase, the size of the defect can increase. So initial management could be conservative for such patients where the, the size of the high drops is smaller but if we see no resolution or increase in the uh, high drops at one to two weeks of follow-up, these patients will be subjected to compression sutures. Grade three, more than five millimeters diameter, it is better to plan compression sutures for a quicker recovery because as we already have seen from basic literature and also we see in clinical observation, uh, long-standing high drops can result in neovascularization. So for a quick recovery, it is uh, important to plan a surgical intervention in these eyes.
So I'll be just showing a few, a uh, few more cases which I had, and this was a case again of a large eye drops, and this patient actually came much, much later. So if the eye drops has been there, such a voluminous eye drops, if it has been there for a very long time, it also leads to fibrosis. So it was really difficult to actually bring the cornea into a position because fibrosis is sort of set in. So uh, we don't have the side view profile, but the cornea was almost like a mound in this patient. And the patient was extremely symptomatic and this was uh, something had to be done for this patient. So we can see how we are starting from the periphery to the center. So in between what is going to happen is that we may have to take repeated sutures because once you start taking sutures, one suture may become loose and one suture may become uh, overtly loose so, and then it serves no purpose because the fluid tends to drain out at the time of surgery itself. So you may have to replan some of the sutures, uh, remove them so it may sometimes be a little time consuming for an eye drops of this nature. So you take one suture and the other becomes loose and you may again have to go and uh, for taking suture at another location. This would be a part of the surgery itself. But when we keep doing the procedure we start seeing the how much difference it starts happening right at the time of the surgeon. So you can see how it began with and how the edema is gradually resolving intraoperatively. So we can see the remarkable resolution and then thereafter the patient becomes very comfortable when you manage these cases surgically. So one more case and uh, this one case uh, where it was not responding because there are multiple loculi, though the area looks smaller, but then this patient was taking a lot of time because there were multiple defects in the central part of the cornea. So this could be seen with the light pipe very easily and again subsequently an infinity sutures was taken. The sutures are passed through the stromal part of the cornea in the periphery and they are like overlay in the center part. So you don't actually pass through the stroma in the center part, in the central visual axis to minimize the scarring which can occur as a consequence. And then once the edema resolves and we are happy with the posterior membrane healing, we will remove these sutures early. And again, we can see remarkable resolution right on the table itself. All right. So that's all I had, and uh, Purvasha had some cases to share, and if there are any questions, we can discuss. I'm not a cornea person, I'm a cataract person, but uh, this was a very interesting presentation. And uh, my question would be that, uh, can you use these same techniques for non-resolving post-operative bullous keratopathies? No, actually, because there the uh, the mechanism is different. Post-op, if you're seeing a desk, like the desmus yeah, membrane detachment, uh, they are simply once you just inject air no, bubble so and you have a... Like the, it has a it has settled in, like, you know, and the, even after some, you know, repeated gas injections or something, there is a, there's a lot of residual bullous keratopathies there in the cornea. Can we you do these uh, procedures or, or has these procedures been tried? Uh, personally, I'll not recommend, I won't favor that. I'll only prefer to just do a desmetopexy with air bubble because there the anterior part of the cornea is normal. Why we are doing this procedure in these patients is because the anterior part of the cornea is biomechanically not normal. So just pushing it against with the you know air bubble, it does not logically make sense for these cases with the SF6 and C3 F8. Whereas there when the cornea is normal post cataract surgery, the stroma is normal. So you just have to simply, and that is just purely desmet's membrane. Here it is desmus membrane, majority of the times it will be desmus membrane along with the duas layer, which is little different. So, and that, which is going to be a little taut also. So here we have to create a compression effect rather than some pushing effect with the um, right. gases. And my second question would be, uh, I saw your post-op regime and uh, you, you have asked for hypotonic uh, saline. Uh, have you tried Riposudil and what is your, uh, you know, if you have, what, what do you feel uh, does Riposudil have uh, a role in uh, in a edema? Yeah, so Riposudil I'll prefer to use only in those cases which are little, uh, I have used in a few cases, however I've not analyzed the effect of it, like to know whether what is working, you'll have to have a large series and it is really hard to know that. Uh, Riposudil can also cause uh, vascularization in the periphery, so when there is a lot of peripheral vascularization already there, I'll not use in those cases because it tends to favor, increase the vessels. 
But if it is just localized to the central part of the cornea, uh, have given a few eyes, whether it makes a difference or not, because uh, it's really hard to say at this point in time. But yes, interesting observation, interesting question to look at. Thank you. And also to add to your uh, query, um, to the answer that ma'am has given, um, Merin ma'am, um, the basic pathology behind the pseudophagic bullous keratopathy is the uh, dysfunctional endothelium also. So uh, even after repeated uh, desmetopexies, if the endothelium has stopped working, the, here it works because the endothelial layer then uh, takes over, migrates, enlarges and then migrates and covers the defect. Whereas in uh, bullous keratopathy, I doubt if it's functional enough to take over the endothelial pump function again. So, ma'am, you mentioned that the main indication for you uh, for doing compression sutures is to prevent vascularization. Uh, in terms of long-term scar formation post-resolution, do you see a difference between patients that have undergone compression sutures versus patients that have undergone conservative management? I think that when you just leave it for, uh, uh, you know, just uh, res resolving on their own with the natural mechanism for large high drops, it takes a really long time. And sometimes the scarring is way more. The whole reason for intervening is to have a quicker recovery uh, because the patient sometimes is symptomatic and then if you just keep waiting for three to six months, cornea some, in some case actually it gets fiery red, like we have seen all that happening. And that is why if we can do a modality where you can have a quick recovery. So that is why we have to follow a certain algorithm because not to generalize like every case requires compression sutures. If it's a small central area which will just subside with natural mechanism, yes, we should target that. But if it is not and if it's taking a lot of time, we have to. Regarding the point about um, scarring, scarring can occur because, but one of the ways, strategies is to apply the sutures are like an overlay, not to pass it through the stroma. So that way is you can minimize the scarring and not to keep it for a too longer time because when the central cornea has healed well, then usually within one month, in, the, in case of keratoconus I'm talking about, the majority of them will be little younger patients. They heal quicker. Okay, so those kind of cases, like I, I don't see there's a lot of uh, scarring in terms of whether you had left them alone versus when you managed them. So in the, from the historical data, I'll say the scarring is sort of inevitable in uh, quite a lot of them, but in some cases, because the edema resolves faster, the scarring, though I'm, uh, because it will occur as a consequence of the breach that happens, but they can be rehabilitated. Majority were, be, were able to be managed with uh, glasses or contact lenses. One case required a PK because it was a long standing and that was a scar was right in the center and uh, that, so one case we had to do a PK. But that would anyway be required for even if you manage the high drops conservatively. Uh, Ma'am, I, ha I have a question. Do you combine always um, the, I mean, compression sutures along with air injection to the anterior chamber or it's is it like you always combine that so air bubble i feel it is important as a part of the procedure because uh, when you see through the operating microscope you're not able to judge where your desmus membrane plane is right. but when you inject a little bit of an air bubble it is more to facilitate your passing the sutures at what level because you're not going deep you don't want to and it's more like a you know when you have the air bubble you know what depth you are going so it's mainly for that purpose it serves as a you know guiding tool for understanding yeah, the level of the Because by the end I saw that in all of your procedures the size of the bubble was much smaller. Yeah, I, I have removed should. them intentionally yeah. because even air bubble I would not want to keep if I can. But I just like to keep a little very minimal amount of air bubble because it just gives a little tamponade. And if patients are uh, not under GA, uh, I will also ask them to be, just be supine for with a small amount of air bubble because they just helps in uh, whatever micro leaks may be happening right. that helps in settling down quicker. So that is also one of the reasons why, uh, you know, you see a dramatic recovery probably in these cases, not having a very large air bubble, but a very tiny one just for uh, a few uh, uh, localizing the area where you see the defect. Can I add a point to that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think she's mentioned it in her uh, paper as well that one of the biggest advantages of this procedure is to avoid the complications of air and gas injections. I think she discussed this, that in the paper, but that said, like she rightly said, when you have a medium or a larger size air bubble at the time of the procedure, which you will remove later, one is to know the depth because the cornea is so edematous, you yeah. don't know, uh, you know, how deep your sutures are going. And I also feel that it benefits in the fluid egress that happens uh, uh, on table. So mm -hmm. the sutures themselves form a wick and, uh, you know, they dehydrate the cornea. That effect is enhanced when there is a bubble of uh, air. So the two way benefit is there and then the air can be removed in the air. Yeah, yeah, very important point because it also prevents the, you know, continuous migration of the fluid while even when you're passing the sutures. 
so and very also right. uh, to add to that point ma'am uh, where uh, primary suturing helps uh, could it be that uh, we can compare it with the analogy of uh, skin suturing suppose where we perform the primary wound closure and we allow the healing to take place at a much faster uh, pace than allowing the secondary suturing and secondary wound healing to take place where a lot of um, uh, inflammatory mediators and all those are and the healing mechanism has to take place just to fill up that much of a defect which is now gaping. So I think uh, primary suturing or primary compression sutures that way help the body uh, in the healing process. Yeah. Scarring is less. Yeah. So see, if you if you just uh, think about how the natural healing is happening, it is by the migration of the endothelial cells. Exactly. So when you are actually com uh, compressing it, you are actually bringing the edges of the tear in a way far closer and quicker. So that natural process also happens quicker. And if the size of the defect is like can be with your compression, can be brought way closer, you automatically achieve that effect uh, right at the time of surgery. So in a way, by multiple mechanisms, it uh, gives you the advantage. So Purvasha had one case uh, to share and uh, if there are any questions, maybe we can have them later. After. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Ma'am, you had asked the question where uh, can this hydrops also develop in normal corneas which have undergone trauma and those with contact lenses or with uh, eye rubbing. I think uh, it's not just the abnormal collagen uh, uh, composition. I think it's also about the arrangement of the fibers. So maybe a, any change in the acute or the chronic uh, ch uh, uh, position of these fibers might have uh, the effect of developing uh, high drops may be because of trauma there is a disruption in the collagen matrix uh, or the fib fibril arrangement and maybe that causes uh, the high drops like picture to develop it might not be very classical but I think that might be the reason why it's happening and it's not necessarily an abnormal uh, pre-existent collagen which is cases in point being blunt injury and birth trauma yes ma'am maybe that is the reason just thinking Yes, sir. We see eye drops, okay? Primary congenital glaucoma, where it is primarily because rise in intraocular pressure, you have, uh, you know, horizontally cornea is expanding. And also, as rightly made him pointed out, forceps injury, where cornea is highly elastic. So, elastic property of the corneal stroma and a dismissed endothelial complex are so different. So, where cornea can expand, uh, to any extent where you have a critical point for a dismissed membrane where it gives away. That's how you have a break and end up having a cleft. So coming back to Madam's question, you know, we suture here the basis is because you have an intrastromal cleft which is a communicating because they've all showed a OCT because I've documented these cases uh, in a children's particularly using a UBM if you see 360 degrees, somewhere you have a potential communicating thing. It's like a fistula, a blind fistula. So that's what, you know, the suturing, what Sunita is essentially doing is obliterating that pocket. So this doesn't work in a bullous keratopathy. So this was a case of an 11-year-old uh, boy who had presented to us at Ambala. And he had this kind of an acute hydrops like picture there was uh, he, this was the first time that he was presenting and uh, we took him up for desmetopexy and this was the post desmetopexy which um, i think day f day 7 also he did not improve and in fact the area appeared larger than before so uh, then he had to uh, finally undergo an optical penetrating keratoplasty almost a 9 9.5 graft here so uh, this is what I wanted to discuss. So was this the right approach uh, to handle this and what could have been done better in this case where uh, such a large hydrops had, we had seen a large hydrops. So Purvasha, what was the uh, time duration between the hydrops and when the 
keratoplasty was done i think uh, between the high drops and the keratoplasty it was two weeks almost seven um ten days so mainly it was done because the edema was not resolving and it that was, was the resolving, resolving even post desmetopexy yeah. so we didn't consider any intervention at that point in time no like we the, just um, because the parents were very uh, unhappy and they were worried and uh, so just post one desmetopexy we decided to go ahead and and suddenly we had not seen usually there is some amount of improvement that happens with desmetopexy but here the edema had worsened yeah. so there was no explanation so, that we could understand yeah if you go back to the previous picture now this kind of edema where we you see multiple uh, you know uh, tra areas of translucency so this shows that the defect is not just one there's, there's a large defect and there are pockets over there so uh, this kind of edema will take a long time to resolve because there is multiple pockets there are, there's not just one linear defect and, the, and and it will be really hard to bridge the gap so in these cases again if you had attempted compression this would be a very strong case for doing compression, compression which is right in the beginning itself without even waiting for it to go to that stage because there's a multiple pockets over there so you take sutures and you'll have a very quick recovery that way i my take would be like if you had done probably now of course all this is in the hindsight if you had taken that possibly your edema would have been uh, you know resolved Limited. quicker mm -hmm. you would have been able to manage how much scarring would have happened that's a different thing because mm -hmm. that you come to know gradually only with time but possibly you could have simply managed with a smaller graft compared to the larger graft which you had to uh, plan subsequently but anyway the outcome looks very good the graft is done really well and uh, yeah but is there any comments Ma madam you can um the patient was not cooperative for the oct i'm so sorry for that yeah. we have documented natural course in a child similar case you know in a weeks time you know progressively expanded uh, we did ask them for uh, many years ago so the intervention like a compression suture parents did not come back 3 months later complete corneal vascularization 360 degree okay so where i couldn't you know offer any treatment thereafter and also madam was pointing out if you have an eye drops in a child in the one eye there is a 87% risk of developing a high drops in the second day in the next one year time within one so year so we have to make sure you know we do collagen cross linking contain all risk factors so that's uh, one of the strategy thank you sir and even doing okay. penetrating keratoplasty in such case must be very challenging because there is a mound kind of thing doing yeah. trephination would not have been that easy that's true and uh, in a kid it's also very elastic right and uh, the next case is uh, dr radhika ma'am's case so if she can just point out a few things about it so basically uh, regarding the like previous uh, that, that's okay sir up to you uh, i have a talk in 5 minutes or so so uh, re even regarding the previous case uh, i wouldn't believe that it's a failure of the compression sutures if all the edema doesn't go away like dr sunita pointed out Uh, uh as we have done in this case also uh if there are uh, sutures which are placed parallel to the limbus in an ex in a hexagonal ma manner in a perilimbal uh, situation and if the peripheral edema is taken care of also then we can prevent the vascularization that is happening like dr murlidhar pointed out so it's because the edema doesn't resolve immediately does not mean that the sutures have not served their purpose even if the peripheral edema is contained then the vascularization is less then we have a chance to continue conservative treatment which helps in two ways one is we can do a, a smaller graft because you have a more compact scar and you can do the graft in a slightly less inflamed situation now all said and done high drops produces some amount of inflammation and you do it in a uh, with a larger button so those two problems can be mitigated if the compression sutures even resolve the peripheral edema just because the central edema is not going away i will not think that it is a failure of course in a 9 year old small but significant issue is amblyopia but i would have put a second round of peripheral sutures waited for the peripheral edema to subside and done a little smaller graft and with uh, less inflammation that would have been my take so it solves uh, you know a few of multiple purposes this particular patient was very interesting i had two more like this afterwards because this is a subglobal hydrops it is a near total hydrops is only a crescent of normal cornea but then uh, if you go back and see the asoct ironically where it had given out where it had given out above that the the stroma was very thin so taking the sutures bridging the uh, break was a little tricky 
because elsewhere the cornea is so ballooned up but in the area of the break the overlying cornea was very thin which is when we hit upon the idea of uh, hexagonal sutures which we also find the same purpose is being served a it brings the anterior layers together b it bridges the gap between the break without actually having to meddle with the thin part and c the venting effect of the suture is also there with this approach is uh, what we try to show in this case i've had two more cases like this after that excellent yeah i think the suturing will be more of you know intro of uh, imagination also put into Correct. place like what works because Correct. it may not be just one way uh, like what we discussed there in multiple patterns and what works in that case we have to sometimes just take as a follow Correct. up individual Correct. case and, and the fluid egress no also guides you where it is egressing more you know your directionality and depth is good over there and so you can yeah yeah and sometimes where the corn is extremely thinned out i mean it's just simply so placing this picture you can see that so that yeah. where the hydrops is there all around the boggy cornea but exactly where the break is there the overlying cornea is very thin so taking it along uh, perpendicular to the break was a little thank you madam yeah the great point and it also helps rescue in cornea uh, prabhaka would agree with me the 10 year 20 years uh, graft survival in a pk is excellent it's mainly because of a recipient peripheral endothelium so if you are able to you know salvage that peripheral recipient endothelium by you know going for expedited suturing i think we also preparing uh, you know patient for a future keratoplasty and a good outcome thank you so much thanks purva thank it was so a very much. illuminating case and thank yeah. you any more questions so have there been cases of perforations while uh, suturing or ha and how do we deal with them is that possible so yeah. yeah. where in a cleft the cleft we vented the cleft and it start aggressing so where you know just give yeah uh, give a air tampon a day and you can proceed with your suturing anyway you are giving a air tampon a day and contact lens it seals you know without much hassle so we don't need a fibrin glue or a tissue true, adhesive true. Yeah, uh, yeah. You sometimes don't have to do anything. thank you so much so thank you sunita ma'am and thank you prabhakar so can we come together for a picture yeah you have a question assalam alaikum i ask uh, did you remove the epithelium before you do your suture or not uh won't recommend that because cornea anyway is very thin so uh, i mean removing sutures will add to a problem while suturing you may have cheese wiring so better not to remove the suture so is there is risk of epithelial ingross if you uh, didn't remove the epithelial epithelial ingross no actually uh, it's don't see that because uh, i mean i've not come across or whether there was very subtle uh, so far i've not come across but yes potential in patients where you are uh, passing sutures just like any other corneal tear suturing but most of these cases are in the center cornea where the risk of having epithelial down growth is somewhat lesser compared to the peripheral cornea where which has a more uh, epithelium has a mitotic potential when you're passing but uh, i have not come across a very bad epithelial down growth so far with a uh, two years of follow up in most of the patients uh, actually also when there is severe edema we do use like uh, remove the epithelium put air in the ac and put manitol sponge like for a few minutes and now i think the uh, you can have better view of the defects and you can do your suture uh, better i think so one can do that but uh, generally when you're passing the sutures the part the ma major part of the fluid which is there accumulate in the stroma also keeps coming also visibility wise i don't think uh, anything additional has been really required but yes uh, all those hypotonic solutions glycerol all Hyp that can be used but i have not used that thank you thank you thank you everyone for uh, being around the session thank you